Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, Al Byers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. It's Tuesday. We are rocking and rolling through this crash course to get you guys ready for Lori Vallow's trial, which starts in six days. Can you believe it? It is time. Real quick, just want to take a moment to express my condolences to Joel from Surviving the Survivor podcast. Uh, He lost his dad very unexpectedly yesterday. My heart goes out to him and his mom and his whole family. Joel's a good guy. I enjoy hanging out with him. It's gotten to be once or twice a week now. He's the real deal, so send some good vibes their way. Also, I want to give a big thank you to Angie and Callie for these cups. Check them out. So she has a website. Look at this. It's Alec Murdoch. Don't trust your soul to know backwoods Southern lawyer. And she very kindly did a pretty lies tumbler. So if you guys want to go grab one of these, go to crafting in organized chaos.com. I'm going to put a link in the description for that. Also, I have a PO box number now. You guys are the best. You always send me a little message just saying, hey, I have something for you. So my P.O. Box is P.O. Box 15257, Greenville, South Carolina, 29610. So there you go. Big thank you to Third Rock Radio and also the people who sent Super Chats yesterday. Really appreciate you guys. So I have some really exciting news. As you know, I got my feet wet doing live stuff with the Alec Murdoch murder trial down in Walterboro for six weeks and long crime has trusted me to interview two of my absolute favorite people Kay and Larry so I'm going to interview them tomorrow I'm not sure when that interview will be aired when it does I will send out link and I can't think of two better people to interview for the very first time I'm super nervous even though it's Kay and Larry and I love them to pieces I hope I do well. So cross your fingers for me. Also, last night I was on Ashley Banfield's show and they texted after and asked if I would be available for the rest of the week. So unless anything crazy happens in the world, which you guys know, it's certainly possible. um, I'll be on Banfield's show for the rest of the week at the 10 o'clock hour. So tune in. If not, I'll post the clips like I did today for last night's appearance. Music fact of the day. I was listening to Marvin Gaye yesterday. I love Marvin Gaye. Uh, But the song What's Going On is something that speaks to me right now with just all the chaos in the world after that terrible, horrible shooting in Nashville yesterday at at the elementary school. And I did not know the story about what happened to him. I knew he was a victim of a crime. But on April 1st, 1984, Marvin Gaye was shot dead by his father at his parents' house in Los Angeles. The argument started after his mom and dad squabbled over misplaced business documents. Marvin Gaye attempted to intervene. He was killed by his father using a gun he had given him four months prior. And so his dad was sentenced to six years of probation after pleading guilty to manslaughter. That blew me away. So we're going to jump back into the, oh, wait, no, y'all. Hang on, we ain't jumping in. Let me tell you about my nightmare last night. I'm so deep in this case, y'all. I dreamed I married Chad Daybell. And let me just tell you, do you ever have dreams where you feel like somebody's standing by your bed and you try your hardest to wake up and you just can't? Well, that was this dream that felt like it took up my whole night. And to top things off, y'all, we had a Harry Potter cake. So I don't know what's up. I need to get into some dream interpretation stuff, but... Man, Chad needs to stay the heck out my sleep time because that's my peace time. All right. So one thing that I have not mentioned that I came across in my old notes going through this is for several months throughout everything we've been talking about, Lori was sending Colby a lot of Venmo transactions. I believe there were over 40 at this point. So just a random little fact. So October 10th through the 12th. Lori goes to Missouri. She is accompanied by Melanie. And before they leave, there are some texts about flights to Missouri that were deleted. 
And Lori says, American has a nonstop flight, Phoenix to Kansas City, Thursday at 1. Then we fly back Saturday at 6.30. And the name is redacted. I think it may be Audrey because that's who said she would take them to see the amazing sights, if you remember. Said we could stay with her, but I told her we would get a hotel. And she could stay with us. So investigators sent a search warrant to Verizon and T-Mobile for Alex, Lori, Melanie's entirely in relation to the attempted murder on Brandon. It would have been great if they would have gotten this um, quickly because they probably would have seen a lot less or no activity on Tylee's phone, which is very odd for a teenager, as we know. But that was sent, and this is October 10th, I believe. So October 11th through the 12th, investigator finds photos of Lori and friends at the religious site. Is it Adam Andiaman? Please let me know if I said that right. In Missouri. This is where LDS teachings say Adam and Eve lived after being cast out of the Garden of Eden. It teaches that the place will be a gathering spot for a meeting of the priesthood leadership, including prophets of all ages, and other righteous people prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And if you remember from yesterday's episode, it seems like Lori may have thought this is where she needed to go to become translated, although I thought she was already translated, but yeah. October 13th, Kay emails Lori asking to see JJ, and they say they miss him. Lori says she's trying to get JJ settled in. The same day, Lori travels to Fe from Phoenix to Idaho under the name Lori Ryan. Brandon meets with a private investigator named Rich Robertson. Brandon wanted to find Alex and the Jeep, which was used in, in the attempt on his life, as well as Melanie's because he had not heard from her in two weeks. Brandon was so nervous at this point, given everything that's happened, and rightfully so, that he wanted to meet at Rich's office on a Sunday. I did. He was on the STS podcast last week that I was on. And I think he's just a great guy. I love Rich. He's a super smart dude. The same day, Melanie's calls Brandon and says, Hey, guess what? I'm moving to Boise. And she said she would go with or without her kids. This was odd to Brandon because Melanie's would never want to be apart from her kids. So they have a text exchange. She says, I've made the decision to move to Boise. We will need to create a new schedule for the kids. We can pay to go to mediation again or save the money by coming to a mutual agreement. I'm fine with whatever you decide. The kids could remain with you in Arizona. You would have to arrange for daycare and I could have the kids for school holidays and summers. Or I could take the kids to Idaho, enroll them in school there, and you could have the kids for school holidays and summers. Please let me know what you'd like to do. So Brandon responds, seriously? Melanie says, yes. Brandon says, why? How is that good for our kids? I don't understand. I will keep them in Arizona and figure it out. But why? These kids are going to need us both. They need things to stay the same and have structure. So he asks, when are you moving? And he says, that's it. No more information. This is pretty important. Can you give me more details? If you're planning on moving, you should have them, right? So finally, Melanie responds nearly an hour later. I'm planning to go next week. Brandon says, what day? And then he asks, are you still planning on having the kids this week and weekend? Thank goodness Brandon said they can stay with me because I really do wonder what, what could have happened had those sweet babies went up to Idaho. So Brandon calls the investigator in Gilbert and tells about Melanie's moving. This is the investigator at the Gilbert Police Department, by the way, not Rich Robertson, who he hired as the private investigator. He said this is odd because she would she never mentioned Boise in the past and would normally never want to separate from her kids. He also said she has a rental agreement until July of 2020 in Gilbert. So October 15th, Brandon calls the investigator again and says he has retained legal counsel. And he's also learned he was still legally married to her. So that meant they still have 50-50 custody and she legally could leave the state with the kids. So Brandon very smartly decides he is not going to exchange the kids with her the next day as scheduled. So the next day, October 16th, Melanie's, she goes to get the kids from school. She finds out Brandon didn't bring them that day. What does she do? Goes to the Gilbert Police Department to report it. And the investigator says, hey, what's up about this move to Idaho? 
She said it was an unplanned move and she wanted a fresh start. She says Brandon was manipulating and threatening to disrupt her relationship with Lori. Investigators note Melanie's had no proof of threats or manipulation. At some point, Melanie's makes a post on social media and it says reward $10,000 for a location of my family. Please help. My ex-husband, Brandon Boudreaux, and four beautiful children have been missing. We had a court-ordered mediation agreement that was broken October 16th when he began hiding our children, and he has not taken them to school since October 15th, so they have been absent and unenrolled due to truant, unexcused absences. I've talked to a few of his friends who shared they have not seen him and cannot get a hold of him. I haven't seen my babies since Brandon took them to Utah for fall break on the 9th. I've exhausted all my resources and now feel my children could be in danger. I feel I should ask for help on here. Taking our children away from their mother for no truthful reason is cruel. I have been persecuted for my faith and accused of false things, but I know who I am and I know truth will always prevail. I will always love Brandon and I'm heartbroken for his choices. I feel now I need to post this truth for any seeking truth amidst the confusion, but mostly for the safety and finding the whereabouts of my family so I can know they're okay. I would be so grateful for prayers during this time and any information leading to their current location. It's very curious because she's leaving her kids and told Brandon, you can keep them and I'll see them in the summer or for vacations. So the same day, Brandon calls the investigator after he learns that Melanie's Guess what? She's still on his financial account. So the same day, Brandon calls the investigator after he learns Melanie's is still on his financial accounts, despite her agreeing in August of 2019 to remove herself. Brandon transferred his money to a different financial institution after learning that. Don't blame him a bit. Also, on this day, investigators with the Chandler Police Department asked the FBI for help with the cell data they got from the investigations with Chandler and Gilbert Police Departments. The Gilbert Police Department started to figure out Lori may be in Idaho due to these phone records. October 17th through the 24th, Lori and Melanie's traveled to Hawaii together. October 18th, Brandon files for emergency temporary custody of his and Melanie's four kids. So there's a text between Lori and Audrey. Lori says, not sure how long we'll be here until our work is done. Also, investigators find photos of Lori in Hawaii on her iCloud account. The night before Tammy Daybell is murdered, Alex is in a church parking lot approximately two and a half miles from the Daybell home. A co-worker of Tammy saw her at work that day and said, normally Tammy was happy to recommend books to read, but this day was different. Her friend Mandy told East Idaho News, I was coming to ask her about another book recommendation and she was just really busy and didn't want to talk a lot. She seemed maybe kind of frustrated and that wasn't typical of her. October 19th, Tammy Daybell is murdered. Chad called 911 and said she died in her sleep. Now, the coroner did not perform an autopsy. He said she went to bed with a cough and didn't wake up. He refused an autopsy, and the coroner ruled the death natural, so Tammy was sent directly to the funeral home. Now, in a 2020 interview, Chad's daughter Emma said they, they, meaning the kids, were the ones who said no autopsy. She said Chad was standing there in shock, allowing them to make the decisions. She said if he was trying to hide something, why would you leave that important of a decision up to your kids? The initial cause of death, by the way, was listed as a cardiac event. So in Idaho, county coroners decide if autopsies will be performed, and the coroner, Brenda Dye, did not order one. County coroners, in, just like in South Carolina, they are elected positions for four years and are only required to attend a coroner school and complete 24 hours of additional training every two years. By the way, Fremont County, they're only budgeted for two autopsies per year. On scene, it was said that Chad was acting like a grieving spouse. So here's my big question. Why would you not want to do an autopsy if somebody who is 49 dies suddenly in their sleep because she has children and grandchildren? I would be worried if she wasn't murdered. This could be something congenital 
that could be passed down that her kids might need to know about. That always kind of stuck out to me. Now, Chad and Tammy's son, whose name is Garth, told CBS News, my room was down the hall. I heard a thump. I heard my dad yell, Garth, Garth, come quick, with the most panic I'd ever heard in his voice. However, 12 days after Tammy's murder, Chad posted on AVAL, which is a voice of warning. It's a website. Remember, we've talked about this where people go and they're kind of like-minded in some ways. It's the prepper thing. Um, He made a post called moving into the second half of my life, saying when I woke around 6 a.m., it was clear she had been gone several hours. I couldn't believe I hadn't been awakened somehow, but all indications are that her spirit simply slipped away during the night. So that's very different than what Garth says happened, which is he heard a thud. Chad was yelling. So then you have Chad saying, I couldn't believe I hadn't been awakened somehow. Gar said Chad was pacing back and forth and saying, why? How could this happen while pointing at her picture on the wall? She can't be dead now. How could this be? What do we do? Well, he failed to tell Garth that his mom had been taken over by a demonic spirit named Viola and Tammy's spirit was in limbo and he had texted his lover. He wanted to free her spirit. What you know, Alec Byers, you know I've been traveling weekly to cover the Alec Murdoch murder trial, and I hate packing. And even more, I hate loading and unloading a bunch of bags when I get back to Walterboro. The Weekender bag from base has cut down the number of bags I need to take and has all the things I need, like a laptop sleeve and even a key leash. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has thought of everything you could ever want in a piece of luggage 360 degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep organized. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors, and for shorter trips, the Weekender bag is super functional and even has a place to store your shoes separately. Every piece is made to look better with miles, so you don't have to worry about it in cargo or overhead. And Base has over 30,000 five-star reviews. Whether you're packing for a quick trip or looking to breeze through the security line, Base has your personal items covered. Right now, Base is offering my listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash what the world. Go to basetravel.com slash what the world for 15% off your first purchase. That's Base, B E I S travel.com slash what the world. Let me tell you all about our sponsor of the week, Pros. There's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care, and that's because your hair and your hair goals are completely unique. My hair is dry and frizzy. I wanted to get rid of these problems. Thanks to my personalized pros routine, I can honestly say I've never been in more love with my hair. First, pros asked me for my hair goals, which was smoother hair with color protection. Their in-depth consultation also asks about you as a person. Pros asked me really unexpected things like my age, hair length, do I get split ends, and even my zip code so that pros can factor in the environment my hair lives in. Next, pros analyzed all my answers and handpicked clean ingredients to help me reach my hair goals. I used the Scalp Remedy, Clarify and Cleanse Color Extending Shampoo, and the Smoothing Solution Volume Building Conditioner. I also used the Boris Hairbrush that makes my hair super smooth. My hair is completely different, the frizz is gone, and it's so much softer. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. If you're not 100% positive Pros is the best care hair you've had, they will take the products back, no questions asked. Pros is the key to achieving all your hair goals this year. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash what the world. That's pros, P-R-O-S-E dot com slash what the world for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Emma, his daughter, allegedly told Julie Rowe that Tammy was found in the floor. So you have several different stories there about what condition she was found in and how she was found in. Now, in an interview on 2020, Chad's kids said they were told Tammy was asphyxiated. 
One of his children said asphyxiation doesn't necessarily mean smothered. According to my understanding, it just means the breath was interrupted. And in the end, she wasn't able to breathe. They also felt like Chad was framed in all of this. They said they also said that Tammy was in failing health. Although I've always found that very suspicious because it seems like Chad and the kids are the only ones saying that she was in failing health. You think you would hear it from coworkers, friends at her church, her family who had just seen her days before and said she was fine. The other thing that never made sense, if she's in failing health, why would Chad or anybody allow her to drive from Idaho to Utah to make that visit to her parents? Doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to bash Chad's kids. I, I don't know enough about them. They have largely remained silent other than this one interview, and I consider them living victims of everything. I don't know how they were raised. It's really hard to judge people when you don't know them, and I, I, I feel sorry for them because they're processing a lot of information and I know at one point they all seemed very defensive of him. I've heard rumblings. Maybe that's not the case anymore. But if it is, then that's their dad. And I guess they have their reasons. But this trial is going to be a big wake up call because we are finally going to hear some very devastating evidence that led the prosecutors to seek death for both Chad and Lori, even though it's off the table for Lori still on the table for Chad. And they don't just throw out the death penalty unless there's hard, solid proof that he was very much involved in all this. So there was a text from uh, to Lori from a contact named Nicole at 9.18 a.m. I'm not sure if you heard, but Chad's wife died last night, and there's crying emojis. Lori responds at 9.33 a.m. Oh, my gosh, I did not hear that. I'm in Hawaii, and it's 6 a.m., and she put two crying emojis. Do you know what happened? Nicole says yes. She awoke in the night coughing, threw up, collapsed, and passed away. Another different version of how she died. Then Lori gets a text from Melanie Gibb, who, by the way, is named Phoebe in Lori's contacts. I believe in a past life, Melanie Gibb was one of Lori and Chad's kids, if it couldn't get any weirder. But Melanie Gibb texts Lori, I heard what happened to Chad's wife. Oh, my gosh. Lori responds, hello, what? Melanie Gibb calls Lori, and they talk for 20 minutes and 45 seconds. After the phone call, Melanie Gibb sends Lori a screenshot where Chad had posted on Facebook that Tammy had died. That post said, I'm saddened to share that my beautiful, talented wife, Tammy, passed away early this morning in her sleep. It is a shock to all of us. She was so wonderful in every way. We are still working out the details, but we plan to hold a viewing Monday evening in Springville, Utah, and then hold the funeral and burial there on Tuesday. We will hold a memorial service in Rexburg on Wednesday at 11 a.m., Seems very rushed, and I think other people who knew Tammy and Chad felt the same way, that this was so fast, especially in light of the fact that she was young, this was not expected. One of their sons was actually overseas on a mission and was unable to come home for his mom's funeral. So Zulema texts Lori at 315. Oh my goodness, did you know that was going to happen? How are you? How are you feeling? Maybe it was you that I saw at the temple getting ready to get married just yesterday. And the girl was tiny, just like you. Lori responds, funny. I love you. Gag. Zulema says, ascended couples. Jules saw them coming soon. Nothing more powerful. She said, I love you too. Lori responds, that's good news. Zulema is texting Chad as she's texting Lori. 3.19 p.m. Hi, Chad. I just saw your post. I hope you're okay. Yesterday at the temple, I had a vision that I was helping a bride get ready and helping her with her white dress. Then I see your post today. The Lord is wonderful. This woman, y'all. Chad responds at 10.14 p.m. Thank you, Sulema. I'm hanging in there. Our family has received overwhelming support. Yes, changes are underway. We've all felt Tammy nearby. She's very happy and already very busy. Zulema responds, her work is underway. I'm happy for her. I'm also excited for what's next. I'm praying for you and your family. Much love and comfort to all of you. I hope to see you soon. Also on this day, Tylee's friend texts that she misses her and has been thinking about her. The friend receives a text from Tylee's phone six days later on the 25th saying, hi, I miss you guys too. Love ya. It's L-U-V. Yeah. 
Y A. And the friend said that did not sound like Tylee. A neighbor of the Daybells tells investigators that the bonfire pit in the Daybells yard was hardly ever used, but they noticed after Tammy's death, there were frequent bonfires. We know Tylee's body was found burned and dismembered right near the fire pit in the pet cemetery. So it makes you wonder what uh, was going on there. So Julie Rowe told Fox 10 Phoenix that she received a call from one of Chad and Tammy's daughters. It was Emma the day Tammy died. She said, Julie, do you know what I'm most scared of? And I said, no, what? And she said, my dad getting remarried. A neighbor named Matt went to the Daybell house that evening and he told KSL TV that Chad did not seem to have any emotion and it was very odd. So October 20th, one of Tammy's daughters, Emma, also worked at the same school that Tammy did. So staff gathers to remember Tammy and to comfort Emma. A staff member said Emma expressed concern about the condition her mother's body was found in, saying she appeared to have pink foam coming from her mouth. So a ticket from Phoenix to Idaho is booked by Lori for travel on October 24th. Chad calls the hotel, presumably to book rooms for Tammy's funeral. Chad has two phones he's using during this time. They're ID'd as a 208 number and a 401 number. He uses the 208 number to call the hotel. Also, at some point, and we're not sure exactly when, Chad cashes in on the $430,000 life insurance policy on Tammy. Sources told East Idaho News in March of 2020 that the money came from different policies and one policy was significantly increased shortly before her murder. Also on this day, Brandon Boudreaux learns of Tammy's death and informs Kay Woodcock. October 21st, there is the viewing for Tammy Daybell. We learned on Dateline that her sister Samantha fixed her hair for the viewing on the screen. I have her obituary October 22nd is Tammy Daybell's funeral. Chad pays for four rooms at the holiday Inn express in Springville, Utah. The four zero one cell is texting Lori on the day of his wife's funeral up on screen. I have the program for her funeral that came from East Idaho news. They were able to get a copy of that. Tammy's sister, Samantha, said on Dateline that she felt like Chad was avoiding her at the funeral. Also, people who were in attendance at that funeral said that Chad was rating people as light or dark at the funeral. One friend, Eric, told Court TV that Chad was telling people specifics about Tammy's death, which nobody asked for, and what happened the morning that she was found. Chad said Tammy had already been to visit him and it was helping him to set his affairs in order, giving him advice on how to handle some of their children and their futures, such as where they should live, what schools they should go to. And he said that he told this group of people all this within about two minutes. Up on screen, I have a couple of photos from the actual funeral. You see Chad and Garth looking over Tammy's casket and then you see Chad with his hands put together and just looking bored out of his mind there's words i want to say y'all but i'm just gonna pass we're gonna keep this family friendly another friend named nate told east idaho news chad actually did not stay very long at the funeral and he was upbeat as if nothing was wrong Now, the divorce between Melanie's and Brandon is finalized, but she's still on that life insurance policy. So he contacts the investigators on his case of attempted murder and informed them of Tammy's death as well. October 23rd, a memorial service is held for Tammy in Rexburg. Just days later, there's surveillance on Lori and Chad, and the detective noted they were seen holding hands, and they note it was only days after Tammy Daybell's murder and funeral. The same day, Lori travels from Phoenix back to Idaho, and Lori, Zulema, Melanie Gibb, Melanie, they all decide to do a podcast. On October 27th, Kay emails Detective Moffitt, please contact me ASAP. We hear there are numerous things happening that have bearing on Charles's murder. October 28th, 2019, Kay emails Detective Moffitt with Chandler PD and says, Chad Daybell, cult leader whom Charles suspected Lori was having an affair, just so happened his wife 
passed away in her sleep on October 19th in Salem, Idaho. I'll send her obituary shortly. How odd is that? I wonder if she was heavily insured. Kay knew. Kay knew what was up. Lori had a large room at their home before she and Charles separated, which she used as a dance studio. She would record herself dancing two to three hours nightly and send videos to Daybell, which Charles discovered she was doing. Then she put, Alex quit his job? Whereabouts unknown. He must be hiding with Lori and JJ. Brandon gave Melanie's $300,000 for a divorce settlement in recent past, like just before Lori moved and before they attempted his murder. Melanie's is obviously the new golden goose since they murdered Charles. They'll run through that money quickly. Also, Brandon discovered Melanie stopped their divorce proceeding two days before the attempted murder. Something about she couldn't collect his life insurance if a divorce is pending. The same day, Alex sends Zulema a picture of Chad and Lori and two other women at a restaurant. Chad and Lori are sitting beside each other and Chad is no longer wearing his wedding ring. Stay classy, Chad. Zulema responds to the text. He looks way too happy. Alex replies, he escaped the warden. So it's all downhill from here. Zulema says, woohoo, he's a happy man. Look at that smile. Alex says, he's a little giddy. And Zulema says, that's so cute. The same day, Alex and Chad go back to that storage unit together. And what do they do? They put in what we now know to be a lot of personal effects of JJ and Tylee. Sentimental things, blankets with their photos on it. We'll get to that later on in the series this week. Bikes, things like that. The same day, Melanie signs the lease on her townhome in the same complex as Lori and Alex. And Brandon tells Gilbert PD he will be moving to Utah to stay with his parents, taking his children indefinitely. October 29th, Lori informs the Madison School District that JJ will be homeschooled. An investigator from Gilbert PD called the coroner in Idaho, Brenda Dye, asking about Tammy Daybell. She said no autopsy was performed, and the investigator notes despite her age and medical history. Brenda Dye asked if there was something suspicious about Tammy's death, and the investigator said that he wasn't sure yet, and so is unsolicited but brenda die said that she spoke with neighbors of the daybell family and they referred to the daybells as extremely religious and there were recent reports of people meeting to plan for a doomsday event october 30th melanie gibb texts Lori, call me it's important Lori texts Zulema saying that Alex and Melanie are coming to arizona the next day and could stay at a hotel but she would rather them stay with Zulema because her house is protected. Zulema says, that's fine. It might be a little crazy with my grandkids and Halloween, but yeah. Lori said, oh, I forgot it was Halloween. So October 31st, Melanie and Alex fly from Idaho to Arizona to move her belongings up to Idaho. What did she do? She left a bunch of kid items on the sidewalk right there. Rich Robertson, the private investigator Brandon hired, was on their tail and he took photos of the U-Haul in the driveway and the discarded items. He told Inside Edition it was all kids stuff. It was clothing, blankets, toys, mattresses, bedding materials. It was all in a pile out there on the curb with a little cardboard sign that said free. He also places a tracking device on their car and follows them to Rexburg. The same day, Detective Hermosillo starts surveillance on Lori for the Gilbert Police Department. Gilbert investigators contacted the Fremont County Sheriff's Office requesting their assistance in locating the Jeep used in that attempt on Brandon. So November 1st, 2019, the lieutenant had not seen Alex or the Jeep, and Detective Hermosillo obtained a search warrant to seize that Jeep when he did see it. Lieutenant Powell from Fremont County Sheriff's Office sees Lori and Chad holding hands while conducting surveillance. The same day, between 5 and 6 p.m., this is so weird, y'all. This story creeps me out every time. Melanie's goes to the residence of a married couple who are friends of hers and Brandon's and stands in the driveway. Brandon had stayed with them briefly after the attempt on his life. So the woman sees Melanie's as she's trying to leave. 
She gets out of her vehicle and goes to Melanie's, who says the Holy Spirit told her that her kids were here at this residence and she was there to collect them. So the woman's like, yeah, your kids aren't here. And she tells her husband that Melanie's is there. At this point, she's alerted Brandon, by the way, that Melanie's has shown up. When Melanie's came inside, she was still asking for her kids and repeated the Holy Spirit had told her where to find her kids. Melanie's tells the couple that Brandon was involved in dark things, but didn't elaborate further. The couple keeps telling Melanie's, look, lady, your kids aren't here. The man says Melanie's threatened them, saying something to the effect of if they knew what was good for them, they would tell her where the kids were. Melanie's eventually left the house and sat in a white Kia SUV parked in front of their house. Get this. She sat in the car for 20 minutes and the woman approached the car to talk to her. She sees Alex in the driver's seat, but he doesn't acknowledge her at all. The lady that lives in this house. She told investigators that she had never seen Melanie's act this way and it worried her. So Alex and Melanie's drove off, but come back a short time later and stopped a few homes away from theirs. Y'all, I'd have been so creeped out just seeing her standing in the driveway. And then you said, the Holy Ghost said, my kids are here. Lord have mercy. These people that have been pulled into this, even if briefly, I, I would just be flipped out. Melanie's got out of the car and just stared at the couple's house for a few minutes before getting back in the car and driving away. And again, the car returned, parked for a bit, drove away. The man said he was concerned for his family due to Melanie's behavior, but didn't contact police because they didn't want to get involved. November 3rd, Kay emails Detective Moffitt saying Lori has moved to Rexburg. She says Melanie's is there and she's sure Tyler would be too. Lori and Chad fly from Salt Lake City to Kauai, they stayed at the Kauai Beach Resort. November 4th, Melanie and Alex arrive back in Rexburg. And November 4th, Chad and Lori have a marriage license appointment. Also, police spot the Jeep finally in the parking lot of the townhomes. Now, they have it impounded. The VIN number that is displayed on the dashboard was concealed. Nobody called to ask about the Jeep once it was towed. Because, you know, when somebody tows your car, you just kind of let it go, right? No. These people are up to shenanigans 24-7. We're going to stop here. So on the next episode, we're going to pick up where Chad and Lori get married in Kauai, which is Lori's favorite place, apparently. So we will see you soon. Hope you have a good rest of your day.